Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, great. So, yes, here I am in the UK, um, but I'm going to be speaking about properties in Australia and in the UK. Um, because some of you probably already know, but we used to we lived in Australia for 25 years. We're now back in the UK, um, so we've got plenty of examples to show you from both countries. Um, so welcome everybody, and um, it's great that you've um, that you've joined us. So we'll get going with this talk about before and after benefits of post property management. Okay, first starting with Tasmania. So um, Laurel Gordon, who um, got onto our, our thing quite a few years ago, um, we, we've dubbed her the Mulching Queen. Um, Laurel has done amazing things with her property, um, and most of it through mulching, which I'll explain a little bit more about in the next slide. But basically mulching is building up the organic matter in your soil in a very expensive way and an easy way to do. Um, which is very important on a horse property because for a lot of horse properties, having the machinery to do things like rip up and reseed and all that sort of thing, you, know, you often don't actually have it. Whereas mulching is something that anybody can do very easily with all sorts of different waste materials or with hay or whatever. And what it's doing is it's covering and protecting the soil um, and building up the organic matter in the soil, which is really, really important. Obviously, I'll go on to the next slide, which um, so that that this slide here just shows you some before and after pictures of Laurel's property in Tasmania. But in the next slide, this is this was our property in Queensland, and th this property was taken uh, a few years ago now. It's probably about eight or nine years ago. Um, but you can see in the, bot in the bottom right picture there, you've got the horses eating the round bale. So this is something we advocate is mulching with round bales. So basically you let the horses eat the round bale, spread it out so the so-called waste becomes the mulch. So you can see in that picture there, top right, where it's, there's been several round bales fed over that area. So there's about there's several inches or several, quite a few centimetres of mulch laid down. And then um, again, going back to the picture on the right, bottom right, you can see how much sand there is previously in that area. So then that area is mulched thoroughly by the horses. And then picture in the bottom left shows you what happens then once the horses have been taken out and um, rain comes along. And then it, yeah, the seeds that are in that hay start to germinate, or you can hand seed into it you got both um you know so the it just makes a huge difference and that's how you can actually create new soil um so mulching is a really good practice during drought for instance so this next picture goes back to laurel's place during a drought um so you know in drought conditions that's pretty good for in a drought and if you just compare laurel took pictures of next door's property at the same time, you can see how little organic matter there is there um, in on next door's property where they haven't been mulching. So going back to that one, <clears throat> huge difference. So even though droughts obviously are really really bad, and um, there's a lot you can do to um, to reduce the effects of the drought and also to make it so that when the drought breaks, your land will recover pretty much immediately if you don't overgraze during the drought. So if you can get the horses out of there before it gets it gets too short, then once the drought breaks, then your land is going to, going to come back so much quicker. So um, another picture here of a before and after picture of a holding yard. So when I talk about a holding yard, what we're talking about is there's various names for it, but basically a loafing yard, holding yard, whatever. It's somewhere to put the horses when the conditions are not right on the rest of the property for grazing. So as many of you or you know, hopefully already know about the equicentral system, which we developed and advocate, basically it means that the horses are always coming back. And I'll just show you a picture here of a, of a basic setup for an equicentral system. It means that you have somewhere that the horses um, keep coming back to voluntarily most of the time. So uh, in Australia, often that's an arena um, that can be 
used as your holding yard or in the UK, people often use an old stable yard or as I'll show you in the next picture, you know, the, you might build, purpose build a holding yard as well. But what that means is that whenever the conditions aren't right, the horses are removing that grazing pressure. And as I said, it's actually most of the time that's voluntary because what happens is horses go out to graze but when they've finished a grazing bout, which is lasts around one and a half to three hours, sorry, yeah, one and a half to three hours, they will then come back to where the water is um, and where the shade and shelter is voluntarily, because that's what they do in the wild. They move around what's called their home range and they move out to the grazing area, but then they move back to shade and shelter and water and so on. And that's what they do in the wild. So the equicentral system is just copying that. It's providing all their resources in a home range, albeit much smaller than in the wild. But what you're doing is you're providing a mini home range for them. So it works really, really well because the horses then start to help you to actually take care of the land. So during a drought or during a really, really wet period, then that means that all that standing around behavior um, that normally just wrecks the land, whether it's too wet or too dry, takes place in a surfaced area instead. Um, and it makes a huge difference to your land management. So this next picture here shows um, Sophia's, Sophia's um, yard in North Scotland. Um, and this holding yard, um, has got various surfaces on it and her horses just love spending time in there. So again, most of that is voluntary, as in they bring themselves back to it. But if the land, if the conditions are really bad, so it's too dry or too wet, then you might actually fasten them in there some of the time, but you never fasten them in the paddock. So they're not standing on the other side of a gate waiting to be let back in. The gate is always open in the equicentral system, the gate's always open back into the yard. The only time the gate is ever shut is to keep them in the yard if the conditions are too dry or too wet and or the horses need less grazing and instead you want to feed them on hay or whatever. So that's where this surfaced holding yard really comes into its own. It means you can control the grazing pressure on your land, but also you can control the, their intake if you want to do. But in the equicentral system, we advocate that they always have hay available, always have feed available. So either grass or if not, they always have hay available. You don't restrict the feed at all. So this next picture shows Sophia's, um, one of her grazing areas. Um, and you can see those horses there, which normally, you know, people would usually lock them up and, um, you know, and restrict their feed and so on. And as you can see there, they're grazing quite happily on long grass, quite safely. That's what we teach with the equicentral system as well, is how to do that safely. It's about having longer grass, which is higher in fiber and lower in sugar per mouthful. So on Sophia's property, she transitioned from a track system. So she had a lot of very compacted soil, um, a lot of weeds and so on. Um, and she transitioned over to an equicentral system and now she has, uh, she spends a lot less on feed throughout the year and so on. So it's worked really, really well for her. Okay, so back to Australia. So we've got Carrie's property just outside uh, on the outskirts of Sydney. So this property, Carrie got into coming to our talks many years ago. She's probably been to more talks than anybody we know of uh, when we were doing lots of talks around the Sydney area. And this is her before picture. So you can see how dry it is um and hardly any feed and Carrie got into the equicentral system when she actually had had an injury I think it was a broken leg um and she came to one of our talks and she was just blown away with the idea of how she could actually use less energy looking after her horses so that's what she was really interested in is um how much uh, energy it could save her while, while she was injured in particular so she's had brilliant results on her property by subdividing the land so that she can carry out rotational grazing, which is what we strongly advocate, is that you have rotational grazing in place. So you're moving the horses around the land. So in that picture there, you can see how you've got the, the, the paddocks are all at different stages. You've got one waiting to be grazed, one currently being grazed in the middle, 
and the one on the right which has been grazed and is now being rested and again that's um what happens to pasture in the wild obviously there's no fences but the horses move across the landscape and areas get heavily grazed but then the animals move on and those areas get a chance to rest and recuperate so um rotational grazing is just copying that so as i said carrie originally got into it because she had an injury but she's just like many people she's just been blown away with all the other benefits so in this picture here at the top there you can see a pony who initially top left was kept as many ponies are sort of kept on minimal feed locked up in a small area and she just could not get his weight down whereas the picture on the right shows this same pony um two and a half years later and what a difference that pony now can graze um is out with other horses instead of being locked up all the time and it's just working so well another interesting thing about carrie's property is that she doesn't own the property so she's had to do everything where you know without having to put too much money into the property so she's got electric fencing her holding yard um it consists of deep um mold, uh, sorry deep bark she uses in on the holding yard and that works really really well i think she's since now because she's more permanent on the property she's got uh, she's put in a new holding yard but for many years she just had this bark um holding yard and it worked really really well for her so back to the uk again uh, looking at some before and after pictures here miss a has um done great things on things on her property um to just before and after of a muddy yard compared to how it looks now so mulching bottom left there you can see um just putting old hay down and then this is the same area taken from a different angle um how much better it looks so again with miss a how she got into it is she had a horse who was very obese and she's just been blown away with what a difference it's made to her horse's lifestyle so looking at these pictures here top left is how she used to look um down to bottom right with how she looks now so she's had just amazing results with this horse who's gone from being locked up all the time couldn't yeah she couldn't have do anything with her to now where she can graze most of the time so this is working really really well for her uh, again in the uk another uh, muddy gateway area so a typical wet area in a gateway um and then that same area after mulching and resting so huge difference there um and again think if you think about it because the horses are not standing for hours on end in that mud you've got many other benefits as well such as you know mud fever um so all those skin conditions that come with standing around in the mud but while they're standing around in that mud they're just making conditions worse so if you can turn that around and make it so that the horses can get themselves off that area the only reason they're standing there is because the gate's shut so if you can actually turn it around um so that the horses can get themselves off that area they will do they don't want to stand there they stand there because the gate's shut so if you provide a surfaced area for them to stand instead they'll quite happily do that and then um then you know it in most cases it results in no mud so it, it's not hard to do once you understand how to do it so um back to australia so this time in victoria another thing we advocate is um so in this in the, on the picture on the left you've got um a channel worn along the fence line which is very common especially with separated horses but you can get it anyway where horses tend to walk down in in one particular path so in this case here um, at Brimham Park they've rolled out which is an adjustment center they've rolled out uh, round bales just on that one pathway and had brilliant results from doing that so if we look at the next picture it shows what that area looks like now and again that's just from mulching with round bales but in this case actually rolling the round bale out, bale out and letting it rot down in place that's worked really really well um in this case so this next property split rock mountain this is in um, queensland just outside toowoomba 
So Carol Stevens has just had amazing results with this property. Saying that, she's put an awful lot of work in. Carol came to one of our talks quite a few years ago, and then we didn't hear anything for from her for years. And she came back to one of our talks a few years later and showed us um, what she'd actually achieved um, on this property, which is just amazing, absolutely amazing what Carol's done. So when Carol bought the property, it was 200 acres, still is 200 acres, um, an adjustment property. And what the problem was, there was no feed um, and the owners were all having to spend a huge amount of money on bought in feed. So um, another something to think about is a horse property should be as sustainable as possible. If you're having to buy in feed, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, obviously there's times of the year when you have to do that, but your aim should be to do that as little as possible. And by using a rotational grazing system, like the Equicentral system, then over time, you should be able to maximize the production of the feed on that land, which is what you should be aiming for. So you're becoming more sustainable, if you like. And this is what everybody should be aiming for because there's only so much land around and it just doesn't make sense to buy land and pay a rent or a mortgage on that land, but then wreck the land and spend lots of money on bought in feed. It just doesn't make sense at all. So by just usually by just changing a few things around, you can change that around completely so that you're spending much less on bought in feed. Now with Carol's property, it was in such a state that she actually had to go in initially, had to spend a couple of years just clearing the land. Um, I mean, the land was so, as you can see here, the pictures of the dams, they actually ended up being filled back in because they weren't viable anyway. And the, this particular property has very good underground water. Um, so they went back to using that rather than um, trying to get the dams working again. But um, <clears throat> they also had large areas that, which had so many weeds on them, you couldn't even get into them on with a with a on a horse, never mind on foot. Um, but it's taken a few years, but the property has just changed out of sight. So that's with a lot of hard work, but with by implementing an equicent, uh, by a, yeah a rotational grazing system, it's just changed things around completely. So. Um, as I said, a lot of horse properties, they don't have the machinery. In this case, they did, you have to use machinery. It's such a large property and it's worth it in that case. So Carol got outside contractors in um, to do a lot of the work. But on a small horse property, there's so much you can do yourself just by mulching, hand seeding and using the, letting the horses help you to turn it around. So by starting to rotationally graze, then the, um, the land will immediately start to recover anyway, because what you're doing is you're applying grazing pressure and then you're removing that grazing pressure. And that's again, what happens in the wild. Pressure is applied through the grazing animals. So by that we mean, um, you know, they graze the area quite hard, but they're always moving forward and they're always moving on to the next area. And the area that they've just grazed has manure on it that they've dropped while they were grazing. Their hooves scatter that manure as they're moving across the landscape. And then that area then gets a period of rest before another herd of grazing animals comes along and grazes that area. Um, and that's what happens in the wild. So as much as we can copy that in the domestic situation, the better. So, um, so by doing that, you just end up with more and more grass every year. Another thing as well is if possible, if you can actually use other grazing animals as well, that even more closely copies what happens in the wild where you, you don't have an area that only has one type of grazing animal on it. Everywhere in the wild has different species of grazing animals on it. So if you can do that, if you can combine horses with cattle, for instance, you'll get even better uh, results from doing that. You'll get much better soil and so on. So in this picture here, it's just a, a, a short example, a quick example showing how, um, how the organic matter builds up in the soil through grazing management. So every time plants are grazed by an animal, what happens is the plant 
um, it obviously shortens the plant and the root system dies back and, sh and, and leaves lots of organic matter in the soil. Then the plant goes through a period of rest. What's above ground grows up again, but also what's below ground, the root system spreads out and grows longer again. So all the time you have these pulses of growth with rotational grazing where the animals are grazing the plants, cutting them back, and then the plants are then allowed a period of rest and recuperation. So then what happens is the, the above ground grows longer, taller and thicker, and, above, and below ground, the same thing is happening, even though you can't see that, same thing is happening. And also what's really important is this is, what's happening is carbon sequestration because carbon is taken out of the air and ends up in the soil. So grazing is absolutely brilliant for carbon sequestration. So horses, just like all grazing animals, are actually really, really good for the environment if they're managed correctly as grazing animals. It's when we keep them in feedlots and, and feed them on lots of, um, on crops instead of grasses that the environmental problems occur but when they're kept as grazing animals, then they're absolutely fantastic for the, for the landscape and vital. So um, your horses can actually help to save the planet. By grazing them correctly, you're actually sequestering carbon and, um, and doing lots of good things for the environment. So another benefit of um, the equicentral system is how much is your horse's behavior, how much happier and calmer they become. Um, as a response of being kept in a more natural system of management. So we, we asked a question once in our equicentral group about behavioural changes that um, horse owners have seen since using the equicentral system. And the overwhelming response was that their horses are more relaxed. So, um, yes, yeah, so we've had lots of comments over the years from people who've just seen enormous differences in how their horses behave. Um, much more relaxed. So as Carol McIntosh says, on this system my horses are so relaxed that they that I do all the grooming, hoof picking, fly spraying, etc. totally at liberty in the loafing yard. No head collars are required. Everything's done at liberty with them. I rarely if ever tie them up. Uh, another comment, horizontal, and that includes X-Racers and, and a Welsh Cob, Welsh Cross, and so on. So, so there's so many benefits from starting to keep your horses as naturally as possibly of as possible obviously in the domestic situation there's only so much we can do but the equicentral system we believe is as close as possible to keeping them in in a natural way um as you can do as 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 is possible in the domestic situation so um, by by providing that holding area, which copies um, what you know their loafing area in the wild, where they keep going back to that same area to rest and recuperate, to lie down, stand in the shade, and and have a drink and so on. By providing that area for them and letting and keeping the gate open back into that area, then you're removing so much of that grazing pressure from the land, and then by adding to that. A rotational grazing system where they're moving from one paddock to the next um, you're looking at the grass lengths and then just moving them on um, when necessary when the grasses get to the right length then you're pretty much copying what happens in the wild and you will see enormous benefits from doing that so if you're interested in learning more about this then have a look at our website equiculture.net and if you go on to there, you can actually sign up to do a free mini course about horse grazing characteristics, which will get you started um, in how to you know, start setting this up for your horses. And it works in any climate. It works uh, whether it's too wet, too dry, uh, which basically most places tend to be one or the other. So it, it will work for you wherever you live. So have a look at that. Um, and I look forward to maybe speaking with you in the future. Okay, thank you.